folks, and welcome or welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima, again, and this podcast was brought to you, among others, by Emil Gorgis, a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian. He's been living here in Japan for the past two decades, eight years of which he's been actively buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in the city, on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So his company has a dedicated loan officer in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts panel sessions. So you're probably already aware that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or if you just wanna have a chat in English with a real expert, drop him a line on emil.gorgis, that's E-M-I-L dot G O R G double E S Emil dot Gorgies at Tokyo Realty dot JP. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right, so we're back with our JR panel today. And this session was recorded a couple of months ago. We talk about the pandemic related trend of people moving out of the city and into more suburban and countryside locations. Now that's a trend that, while not as extreme as it is in many other countries, definitely exists in Japan as well. And it has been intensified during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we pontificate on that for a while. What does moving out of the city mean in Japan? So city versus country lifestyle options, the availability of infra infrastructures and public services in the countryside, and everything really from internet, medical facilities, education, transportation, English language support. We also talk remote work options and tools, how to conduct the proper research before deciding to move out of the city, and what does it actually take for someone to make that move? Who should be considering it? And we also talk a bit about Emil's family uh, recent run-in with COVID. They all got it and they've since recovered from it. And then we also chat a bit about the very Japanese custom of letting kids uh, transit or walk to and back from school, which is a mind boggling uh, concept for most Western parents, how it works, why it works and so on. So good little session there, probably less on topic as far as concrete real estate property related conversations go, but still very interesting, I thought. Enjoy the conversation and I'll see you again on the other side. We are kicking off because it's a beautiful spring day really? here in Tokyo. Yeah, I'm looking at my window. Um, of course, my backdrop here. It, it is a stunning day. I've been up since 4.30 though, so. Why would you do that? Well, I'm writing a book. I'm writing a collaborative book, actually. And um, and and there's writers from um, uh, the US and writers in the UK. And uh, like, because I'm right stuck in the middle, it was like, I just drew the short straw in terms of times, time zone roulette. So, um, so we had an editorial meeting. So it was just like, okay, Tracy, you're up at like, no. So I yeah. got up and I was just absolutely hideous this morning. And it was dark and it was cold, but now it's beautiful. So it is even though I'm happy with the weather. Gorgeous. Oh, and here he is. He's coming in. There we go. So we are already recording, Emil. So we are already recording. Oh, and you're in out. You're outside. Um, and you're upside down. Am, am I out? Am, am I? Am I not? Let me, there you yeah. are. Okay. But we we were actually just having a little chat about how one thing that the pandemic has done has sort of there's a lot of people who are looking de, de Tokyo, they're, they're decamping from Tokyo and really looking at ways to de, like to have lifestyle options. Um, and I mean, because things like infrastructure, you know, you can be in the middle of like in the middle of Tohoku and have like gigabit fast internet. So and be, not all of the time, though. Well, not all of the <laughs> time, all but all I mean, it's Gotta be careful about that. Yeah, it's possible. So, you know, there's, and that's obviously really interesting for people like Matt and Ziv because you guys, you really look at the rural areas for real estate 
and people are making lifestyle choices now. So I just did one thing, definitely a pet peeve of mine. Uh, I may have mentioned it before, but in a lot of my travels, especially through Inaka, um, I'm I'm pretty nitpicky when it comes to net systems networking. Um, and I'm running tests pretty much everywhere I go. Often enough, you know, there's, there's an interesting... <laughs> my kind of guy, I like it. There, yeah. there, there's an interesting, it's a problem, I would call it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of marketing about gigabit networks and services and things like that. And technically speaking, it's correct. Practically speaking, a lot of the time, the engineers who are setting things up are just sort of, you know, grunts who don't, exist, you know, they know how to plug it in, but don't really know whatever there's any number of reasons what i'm getting at is a lot of the time uh establishments who are advertising wi-fi or gigabit wi-fi or gigabit networks or stuff like that completely and utterly fail at administering their networks correctly such that you're getting i'd say on average i mean it varies but it's not all surprising if i'm at you know four megabytes or less per second for up and down, um, which is actually kind of good. A lot of the times it's worse than that. I, I tested a network that had a 0 0.01 Mbps rating and they were advertising wow. services. And so at some point, I have no idea when I'll be able to do this or work with people to affect it. I think that a very uh, important element of the kind of what you're talking about with the Tokyoing going to not Tokyo is what I call it is network, not access, so network not accessibility so and functionality and so getting a group that. of uh, network engineers or otherwise, you know, people who are rather astute with IT, uh, working with local communities to properly administer and set up their networks such that people like us and anybody else can go there and expect to have uh, uh, accessibility. Well, I mean, I've got, I've got friends who are in like deepest, darkest Chiba, like basically in the Mm, yeah, like, yeah. you know, Kamagawa, like right in the middle. And, you know, they're getting, I mean, he's a systems engineer. So, you know, he's got, he's got, but he's got, they've got two gigs to their house, uh, uh, two gigabits to the house. And it's actually running at about that. Um, they don't have a lot of drop off. So it's like, you know, he's running, you know, fintech servers and stuff. So it, out in the middle of nowhere and um, yeah. they have the lifestyle, they pay practically nothing for their, um for their place and look out on rice paddies all day so it's awesome. i mean that's the thing it's like the systems admin kind of scary if you don't know what you're doing but if you do it right once you're probably good for a while so just like you know maybe pay that's 500 right. bucks or whatever yeah. to get it done and then reap the reward i want to just touch on hey everyone oh, <laughs> so i'm a bit late Hi. i want to touch on the point <laughs> that you know you said it's lifestyle right um i just i can't imagine lifestyle for me that doesn't equate to lifestyle i think just that the the city life tends to be i don't know i'm coming to the the, the defense of city life city life tends to be a bit demonized for why wouldn't everyone want to go about further and i know you guys don't think that but just like you know the idea like being out there and moving away from the city like i, I don't want to do that well, like even that beach trips is is, is different it's like I'm a city. I'm with you. Long. I'm a city mouse. I mean, I had Uber Eats delivered to my desk yesterday. It was a sandwich yeah. delivered to my. You can't get that in the city, in the country. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you know, I was busy working. I could not stop. I was like in the middle of like this massive project, and and I couldn't stop. So I ordered all Uber Eats to my desk, and it arrived, and I was fed and watered mm. and all the rest of it. So yes, there are there is a trade off, mm. <laughs> but you have choices. Yeah. So. I mean, I but that's really the, yeah. the issue too, right? Is determining what choices you want to make and depending on those determinations, figuring out kind of what your bandwidth for, you know, rural or exurban or otherwise not dead center in the metro. And whether you can, I mean, we're all fortunate to be in a position where we're running our own businesses or um, at least very close to running our own businesses. We can actually, you know, maybe because we're foreigners, maybe because we're, we're kind of, you know, technologically savvy but we can actually choose the lifestyle whereas there's a lot of people out there that just can't e either or like people stuck in the countryside or people stuck in the city right there there's that and then also kind of going back to the the network thing 
There are certainly people who, for whatever reason, do not have the ability to uh, uh, kind of leave the metro area. But there's also the middle ground of people who have not yet been empowered to do so, don't have, haven't been educated or otherwise are unaware of certain tool sets or, or resources that if they were to use, then options would open up. But for whatever reason, they aren't yet privy to that. Mm. Yeah. And um, I think it's like like in everything, and we used to um, run into this problem a lot when I was living in Australia, it's uh, a lot of it is supply and demand. Like if there are enough people out there who demand it, then, you know, the infrastructure will have no choice but to appear, right? Mm -hmm. I'd say too well, that there's... there's... That, that's just exactly... An... Oh, go, go, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say that's exactly to Tracy's point before, is what this pandemic has has created is now the opportunity for people to go so it has reached it has created that um demand that infrastructure and remote working be a thing right so previous to that like no remote work was some jobs allowed at some days right very rarely we meet someone who's purely in the office whereas now it's like you go to the office every day is like what is wrong with your company? Yeah. Right. And we think that, right? It's just completely flipped in the past two years. And so I think the tools are definitely there to, to go, um, like to, to be able to work remotely. It depends on, on the job, like the nature of the person's work. Like I know people that are school teachers. Obviously, that's not, that, that, that's not a thing. Um, but I, I mentioned sort of like, especially last year, I think when we were, we were ramping up these, these podcasts, what I was noticing with a lot of clients is the ones that were, like pre-pandemic, they'll, they'll always, they, they have to be in the office, right? So they have to be in Tokyo. Now, they, because they can be remote, there's sort of two, two types of, of people in general. The ones that always wanted to sort of live out away, right? They don't like being in the city. They don't want to be here. They have to be here for work. Now, because they only go to the office once a week or once a month, it's okay for them to, to purchase a place further out. Um, like in, in a different prefecture and, and like, you know, not in, not near Tokyo at all. And then there are the ones that they still want the city like uh, to be in Tokyo. They don't want to go straight up country or straight up, straight, uh, straight up rural. So they're the ones that are, okay, I still want to be in Tokyo, but instead of 10 minutes from the, from downtown, I can be 25 minutes, 35, 45 minutes. Um, and instead of being seven or eight minutes from the station, I can be 10 or 15 minutes from the station. Um, but they're still city style like city people um and that, that's kind of it's just allowed people to to do these these things but i think right now people are very much aware of the tools right that happened over the past two years is is my take on it there isn't anyone who's sitting down thinking oh i wonder if i'm able to work from home or what's all this talk now like two years into it um i don't know if they they are ready like i don't think they're ready to make that transition it, the people that are are the ones that it's sort of being forced on them and they're like oh okay i'm already doing this and now because the, the whole real estate move process it's such a long period right it's not mm -hmm. something that oh i've got it now and i can do it next day so it takes time it's like you know a three to 12 month i think just mental mindset if they're going to make that transition and most of my clients are families there's a lot to discuss it's not a, a single person just say hey well i'm going to go here i'm going to go there it's like you've got to change like kids got to come out of school right like we we have long discussions whether or not we go to australia how long over the school year like we will we miss out on one two or three weeks of schooling for the kids um for just is the ho australia holiday worth it that much to miss out on schooling i think you know uh um tracy and if you guys are probably similar whereas uh yeah so so relocating completely um, for a family is like yeah a big big decision which uh, takes a long process i think i'm i'm going all over the place now so uh, uh, the covid co co covid brain is hazy i wish you guys get back to it <laughs> oh how are you man you, you, have you um... got covid yeah oh i didn't mention yeah like the, the whole the whole family oh no yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm on i'm on i'm, I'm getting better yes that's right i thought i told you um yeah uh, i'm getting better my, my kids had it at the start over the past two weeks or past 10 days or so the youngest daughter sort of she was she was a little weird we, we, yeah, we were very careful and whatnot but you know when kids go to kindergarten it, it's 
there's only so much you can do. And then it sort of sneaks into the house. She got it. Then the elder boy got it. Then the middle boy got it. My wife got it. And I thought, oh, I've had my, my wife's double vaxxed. I'm triple vaxxed. I got my booster like a month ago. Um, and I'm like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I've you know, made it. The booster's working. Booster's working. You know, no, it's not working. No. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, <clears throat> and to last week. So I got it. Um, the weekend was pretty much the worst in terms of just, you know, symptoms and, and, and run down and tiredness, um, getting better. Everyone else is completely fine now, like no fevers and stuff. Um, I'm still a bit like no fever today, but still a bit yeah, my friends have said the brain fog, you know, when they, you know, normally they do math and they can't, you know, you can't even do math and it's just, it's really, it's really rough. But fortunately this yeah. One late, like the, the one that guy is going around is it's you know Omicron. It's, it's Omicron. It's not so it's, bad. Like it's manageable, right? It's still, yeah. you, don't, you don't want it on it. You don't wish it on anybody, but it is. I've, it, I've dodged it so far. Two and two and a half years, man. You're right. It, it it's manageable. We're like our family's managing it, but I can really see how um, it will. It can knock someone off if you're like slightly, like you know, compromised. You know, a little bit unwell, not in the best condition. Um, I, I can feel getting into my lungs. I had pneumonia like a decade ago. And so I know that lung infection, really bad sort of thing. And it's that kind of feeling and sensation. And I can imagine, yeah, wow, if if you're not able to fight that. It or if you were really vaccinated. Mm. Yeah, like, yeah, however, however hard it hit you. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to think, like, how is my how much is my vaccination helping versus is it doing anything? Is that why my symptoms are like this and I'm not even more knocked out? I like to think so. Yeah. Um, because I'm, you know, I don't, I'm, want, I, I don't want to test the theory. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, don't want, I don't want to test it. Um, but uh, yeah, like touch with everyone's sort of okay and on the mend. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also kind of a bit relieved that we've gotten it now. I've got like travel plans coming up. We're going to the US in May. We're going to Australia in August. Is a plan in Christmas, and you know, I don't want to have that happen right before yeah. the trip. Then we can't go. I was actually meant to be in Australia now. Like well, I was, that's right. Uh, you were. I was remember I was I was meant to go to Australia for my my, that's my grandmother right. passed away and, and that's right. And um, then and, you hadn't you hadn't actually had COVID last week. But. My, my my daughter got it like I was meant to fly out on Monday. Yeah. So yeah, like Monday of last week. Um I was meant to fly out on Monday, but my daughter got tested positive on the Saturday. Uh so it's like okay, so I about had to cancel the flight basically. Uh, mm-hmm. Lucky they did it without penalty um which was good but yeah so i got impacted that regard but uh, thank god everyone's okay so hey sorry let's, this is not not real estate let's get back into it <laughs> the, um, the, the country versus city life i wonder how the medical facilities are how how is it out where you are matt if you were to get um, infected tomorrow how easy is it to get medical care and get to a hospital and so forth Oh, super easy. Uh, if like in case of like a serious uh, sort of situation, there's a number of major hospitals in Atami. Uh, so I can get down there in, you know, 10 minutes or whatever. Um, and there's a number of medical facilities around Yugawara. They aren't, I mean, it's a small town, so they're not as robust as, as a larger city like Atami or obviously Tokyo. Um, but for kind of everyday or like general uh, medical needs, completely, uh, Completely serviceable. Is it like that in Olinaka in Japan? I wonder because I keep reading about infrastructures being scaled down as people move out. No, it's not, and that's a fact. Just like with the with the internet um, administration stuff, there's a number of things that you have to consider when you're checking out Inaka areas. One of them is medical facilities. Another is IT infrastructure. What about education and and family services? Right. It's not the case that everywhere is awesome and you just didn't know it there are a number of determining factors that you must research and be aware of unless you wanna run the risk of making a bad decision. Um, this, is, this is one of the frustrations that I have with a lot of the uh, reporting on Akia and Inaka as well, is a lot of them really kind of don't touch on the various potential negatives of a given uh, municipality, jurisdiction, or, or region. Right now, Wakayama is getting boosted a whole lot And I like Wakayama, but the fact is a lot of the areas that are getting pushed right now are severely lacking with, you know, kind of medical facilities or or otherwise. And that's not that's not to say that they're bad places, but so far as them 
being like a reasonable place to relocate for a certain type of person, certainly. Um, but for, you know, as Emil was talking about, for a family, for example, uh, it would be very difficult um, for kind of your average uh, type of person or family. Um, and so it's these a, it's a kind of chicken and egg, though. Like, you know, uh, you know, if you build it, will they come? <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, you know if, you, if you find a really good deal out there and you can survive and enough people do it, will they, will, will the shiakshos actually put the infrastructure in to match the, the you know, well, and that, I mean, that speaks to the like the dynamic problems that need to be addressed right now. I personally don't think that, like, I mean, if a family wants to work with us and find an Akia and, you know, make a move and do everything correctly, absolutely, it's business after all. Um, I don't personally, though, think that families really should bother looking simply because families, by their nature, because their children and responsibilities and relations and all of these things that go into that, by their nature, have more requirements than you know a single person in their twenties, for example, right? Sure. And so and, I, and I think a lot of the the rural initiatives, by and large, are focused on getting families out there, and I think that's absolutely insane. Get the younger people who are single. Um, and again, Wakayama is going to be a hard sell, but somewhere in Kanagawa, because it's close to Tokyo, you can still have access to all of that stuff. Get younger people and probably more single people probably also in IT or various, you know, remote work capable industries out to Inaka. Stop trying to get families. It's not their time yet, right? You've got to build the infrastructure and build you know, financial uh, viability of an area. And that's not going to get done by families. That's going to get done by more nimble uh, actors. And well, Then actors. what you do as part of your service when you look into a let's say potential properties for people, do you also look at the area, tell them what they can expect when they move there? Oh, absolutely. That's a major part of our services that generally comes in the second phase, although it's in consideration from go. Um, if we don't have, I mean, we gather that information right at onboarding to, you know, do you need educational facilities? Do you have kids? You know, this, that, or th like, what are your circumstances? Be as precise uh -huh. as you can, right? Because uh, you know, to be fair, not not all not all shiak shows are built the same. Like I've been into cer certain you know parts of rural Nagano, and the shiak show is like is really engaged in things like things like the footpaths. What do you call them? Sidewalks, Matt. Um, no, they're <laughs> they're you know they're they're they actually exist, and they have like you know they they've got all the the services for um, uh, you know the people who are blind for example so um a, a lot of in some places the I, i've actually seen um the electrical cables have been dropped underground which you yeah, know they yeah. haven't even done that in tokyo so but there are certain you know there are certain regional centers where the mayor or you know the city office is just really highly motivated and highly engaged and um and you can just see it by walking around the the neighborhood how um you know how on the ball they are and they're actually those places have a lot fewer akia because um people don't want to move out of there they're, they're just they're um they're having such a good quality of life we interrupt this broadcast, I always wanted to say this, we interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, or if you just need summer quiet to hide away from the world. So they offer a variety of options for families, for corporate relocations, or simply if you're transitioning between homes in Tokyo. Now the properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They've got fast, unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in, a fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but long term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, you definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. 
And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profits or a holiday home that you want rented out when not in use via short term stays, drop them a line today. See how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth your visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at emil.gorgies, G O R G W E S, at tokyorealty.jp. Hmm, precisely. And so, I mean, it really is a socioeconomic, and honestly, it's a socio psychologic uh, issue. So, socio psychologic. Yeah, I haven't heard that it's one like before. Like a social or whatever you would call it, but I mean, it's it's not just oh nobody wanted to live there, so of course it's abandoned. It's no, there's 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 a, a wide range of reasons that when added together and taken cumulatively, equal mm. something hasn't happened, right? Mm. I guess that's in support of your uh, what you were saying before. Is if you really want to revitalize an area, it's a very good idea to get not just single people, but like you said, people who can actually. People who have some sort of, um, I don't know, IT or technological savviness to them so that when they move to this area, they know what they need and they can work together with local government to help set it up so that then the infrastructure exists for families to move there down the track. Exactly, exactly. It's not that I don't or we don't or any, like, I would love families to start moving out of Inaka or out to Inaka provided that they can do so reasonably and have, you know, a certain level of quality of life. If, you know, they have to struggle and all of this stuff. Again, there's probably some families that are into that. And if they are, that's cool. But generally speaking, a family is going to have a harder time living outside of Tokyo simply because right now the infrastructure is, is insufficient to support them. Right. And for those families that are looking to buy in Tokyo, reach out to me. I'll help you buy a house <laughs> in Tokyo. Yeah, that, that's all, all my clients are like, yeah, no, nah, they, they want to buy a place nice, local here. And we even talk about, you know, in our discussions, you know, we talk about rural and stuff. It's like, oh, okay, what's the what's the foreign population in this particular ward, right? We're talking like wards within, within the 23 wards. Some wards have more foreigners than others. And then it's also mixed, you know, like uh, the on the... You can find it often on the, the website, but the regular newsletter that the wards or the cities send out will say, you know, the foreign population is, you know, this 10% of, of like Minato, for example, is, is foreign. And of that, the breakdown is like, you know, European or Western or Asian. And it says sort of the percentages. And depending on like, so not, and not all foreigners are, are like the same group, right? You have different ethnicities and stuff within that, that group. So you may want, Okay, one district maybe is more uh, uh, um, attractive for you than, than another. So those things, even within the twenty three wards, right? We we see those kind of uh, those kind of changes, or we're looking at it. Oh, I will need to be within the Shibuya Ku boundary, okay, or within Setagai. So you know, with on this you know scale, we're talking about like prefectures, right? Whereas the same with a similar discussion that happens within you know, even just train lines or um, uh, city boundaries uh, adjacent. I want to be, you know, I want to be in Setagaiku. I don't want to be in, in this, in, in Nerimaku or Suginamiku. Um, some are slightly more affluent than others. So even just the, the boundary. And you see price differences um, just by crossing mm -hmm. the road. Um, so and that happens in, in all countries as well. So and in central Tokyo too, just the other side of the street, a lot cheaper. Why? Because it's a different district or different school zone. Um, it's a big thing. And then the elementary schools, like, you know, we talk about infrastructure, you know, one of the, some places here is like, oh, this, this town had like their, uh, their information, they have English information, English support at, at the ward office, which a lot of the, the, the main ones in, in 23 Sometimes wards. in the most unexpected that. of little townships, you suddenly see like yes. a huge, huge English awareness that you don't see in the center of a big oh, city. Like, there, there, there are some parenting groups on, on Facebook, like for kids' schools and stuff, and people post links to, so sometimes they post links to government websites or municipality websites that have, this is a, you know, the entrance guide for kids entering Japanese elementary school, like just a guide for what to expect as parents. This is an English version, and it is a, like basically the Japanese big fat booklet. It's a full English 
correct translation of the whole thing with all the graphics and everything. And it's some like, you know, Inaka Prefecture has just done this awesome killer job that, that is not is not that, being done low. Like, those are probably the kinds of places that Matt was mentioning, the kind of Inaka places that actually have, you know, the, the brain capacity to understand that they need to make it more attractive for people to move in. It's suggestive. It's positively suggestive. Uh, but like we were yeah. talking, or still are talking about, it's a complex issue. Um, and so like a lot of the times, like when this kind of thing happens with, oh my God, where'd all this really excellent English translation come from? That's very accessible. A lot of the time where, where that happens, it's been, there's been a, like a very focused effort on exactly that and hasn't, you know, put in an effort on any number of various other things all right. that to be addressed. Um, and so sometimes, not all the time, um, I honestly can't even say half the time, but sometimes uh, you'll find places that kind of look like they might be accessible, but they haven't done the other things that are required. And so really that ends up being a waste. Looked at in the short term, it ends up being a waste of, of resources. Looked at in the long term, like I was saying, it is suggestive that, you know, they're trying to do something. So if you integrate with them and, you know, maybe guide them a little bit, then they'd be open to other uh, initiatives. Um, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, pretty complex. A big one for me, like, you know, kind of I, what, what Tracy mentioned, uh, that what, it's a chicken or the egg, okay? If you build it, they will come versus they need to come first. And then, like, well, what, what is it first? I think, uh, I like, to come and then expect when enough people come, they're going to build the infrastructure. The idea is nice, but when you're that guinea pig with your kids entering the school system, yeah. and yeah. it takes... Like, because kids grow quickly, infrastructure takes many, many years mm -hmm. to develop. Like, to rebuild a school is several years. So, oh, it's old school. So, if enough people start coming here, or enough foreigners, oh, they're going to introduce the English system. Yeah, not by the time my kid has finished the school, right? So, that that's the thing that it, it, it breaks down when you look at it at an individual basis. Statistics, yes. But for the individual family to make that jump, no, no not at all. Uh, so... That's why, like, like when families, it's always about the kids. So one is just proximity to schools, elementary schools, mm -hmm. um, because they, they walk, and that's significant, um, as as you know, uh, you know, Ziv and Tracy would would know. Um, the other one is uh, the like just like we when you got mix, mixed kids or foreign kids, the concern is also well, how will they fit in? Okay. And I've got, I've got three little ones. And so that's definitely a concern for me, which is why my first house was in Shibuya. This one's in, now I'm in Setagaya. I'm still not far from, too far out because, you know, I want it to still be, you know, I don't want my kids to be looked at strangely, like, oh, they're foreign. And like, they get that to a, a degree. Oh, you speak they English? That. They kind of get yeah, that anyway, they, right? They get that to a, yeah. But you understand, like, but the kids... See foreign kids like the, all the Japanese kids. They see foreign kids everywhere. There are multiple foreign kids, mixed kids or foreign kids in in the schools. Whereas I think it's and and the parents are completely unfazed by by me. Right, and I'm not you know uh, easy to, to not phase someone. Um, whereas I think if you go out in you know, Kali, even my like you know my my wife went on a trip some time ago with, with some some friends, some foreign friends, and she went to the Koban like you know, went to a Koban. To, to ask for direction and and like one of her friends like wow you know white friend was was walking out first and, and the police are just like this at the, at the, <laughs> at the police box like you know like I, I can't serve you um it's different so uh, i think that that's also for families a big concern like we do everything for our kids right um and it's such a big concern so the idea of even within local like within tokyo I get lots of families are like, uh, yeah, no, no, I, I need to be within this area, within this district, within this section, just because <laughs> that's where we have friends, that's where you know, there are other foreigners, that's where the school bus, the international school bus routes are a big one as well, um, let alone out to a completely different uh, prefecture. But on that front as well, like um, like reading English in the city hall or on the signs or what have you, I've actually been surprised when we moved from... Um, central Fukuoka, then to suburban Fukuoka, then back to central again, we've actually noticed, um, maybe it's because 
a lot of the foreigners want bigger space. So there were a lot more foreigners actually living in the suburbs and, you know, with the big yards and the big rooms. We actually had a lot more um, English friendly, foreigner friendly teachers in the school, a couple of mixed kids. And now suddenly when we move back to central Fukuoka, not so much, right? It, it really depends on the area, but I guess Tokyo, Tokyo could be a little bit different to that. Well, well Tokyo's, Tokyo's just got larger foreign population in general. So anyway, you kind of go, like move central out, like there's still large amounts of foreigners. Yeah. Like they're still accessible. Um, but then like, if you just go out, like then as you get further out, like towards Yokohama, for example, there's bits where like the, the, the German school is located, right? Um, uh, towards Yokohama. So around where the German school is, easy access to that has large, a large German population. It's, as you said, like, as I said, for like where the kids go to school, parents will gladly go around international schools or easy access to them, right? Um, uh, the American school out in the uh, Chofu, Chofu, ASIJ. Um, there's the, the whole area around it, right? Lots of foreigners in that community. But um, have you yeah, seen, but have you well. seen the uh, the American school um, bus routes? There are hundreds of them. That well, no, there are pretty much yeah. anywhere in Tokyo. You can you, you're not far from an American school bus. It's it, there are so many of them, and they do crisscross everything. But um, yeah, they, they, they do, but they, like the international schools often won't advertise, they won't, they don't publish, like there's no public list available um, be, and for safety reasons. So that, that mm. makes complete sense. So you won't say, oh, where is it? And see a big map over it. But like uh, the, the Azubu area has several bus routes that go around, of course, for a lot of the expats there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they do go everywhere, but also they go more some places than others. Right. They, they know where the certain demand demand is, right? So it looks like it's everywhere, but also it's not really everywhere. It's. <laughs> but I was just looking for a client who was coming for a couple of months and, and they wanted to be on a bus route. So I actually, I was able to get the bus routes um, and, uh, you know, give the pros and cons of the different, you know, my different properties based on, you know, what time the bus was going past. Because, uh, you know, it's not just, that there's a bus going past is like, is it at the start of the route or the end of the route? So, you know, what time of the day do you, you know, sometimes you're going to be there at seven and other times you don't have to be there until eight, depending on how far it's going to go. It's a long bus route for little kids. Yeah. It's a really oh, long way to go. Yeah. So, so like, I know, I think like around Yoyogi, Uehara and Meirama area, there's two yes. routes and they're, they're, they're kind of like the, the, the last, so they're the last pickup, the latest pickup and the earliest drop off. Um, and you know what, and, interestingly, that's where my houses were. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so but, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but like around the Azaba area, there's, wow, it's great. Like the, the latest bus pickup is like 7 a.m. They start from 6 30, 6 15. Oh, yes. Like they pick up the kids. Yeah. The latest pickup is like 7 or 7 10. Um, and then, then it shuttles out. But I was just like some parents, though, I met, they are kind of, they're split. So when both parents work, the extra hour each way is daycare. So I was just going to say, house, I was just going to say, I don't think I'd mind that much if my son would have left home an hour earlier in the morning <laughs> and, and come back an hour later. Yeah, right. yeah, but my yeah, kid, he, my kid gets car sick. It's just like that would just be miserable for him to sit on the bus for like an hour and a half each way a day. That's just miserable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, well, like it, it depends on like the, the family and whatnot. Um, yeah, but but yeah, but there, there's there's different ways of thinking about it. So for me, it's like time. I want to be as close and me because I think my kids' time is also valuable. Maybe mm -hmm. also because I work from home a lot. So the sooner they're home, we get to sort of spend more time together and, and dinners together and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, it, it, it's a case by case basis, but yeah, there's two ways to, to really think about it. But yeah, even just down to, to bus routes, um, I get like, lots of clients like that, that's where the buses are. And you know, it's like a, a, a seven to 10 year commitment because like with families, because when the kids entering elementary school, especially if they're going to have like two kids or three kids, right? It's, you know, six years for the first kid. And then the second, third kid will come like, you know, two to four years later. So it's basically, you know, uh, what's that? Six to 10 years, like a, say a decade commitment. It's justifiable that you want to live close to this thing, right? Yeah. If you're some people that are just, ah, I, live, I work in this particular area. So I need, I need to have easy access to my job. That's one year 
like they, they, they may change jobs in one or two years, right? There's no or real long term. Reshuffled forecast. into a different location or what? Yeah. <laughs> Precisely. Whereas with when the kids are starting school, like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be here for a decade. That's long enough to think I, I can own this house for a decade. When they move, if things change after that decade, yeah, I, that's, I, I can sell it and not feel it's wasteful. Um, I often tell my clients, like, if you're thinking, if your situation is going to change and you're thinking you may not, you may have to sell this house, this property within two to three years or like, yeah, say three years to four years is kind of that break-even period. If it's less than that, if it's sooner than that, you might not come up on top because the it's um, about 5% of, of uh, purchase fees, uh, of, of closing costs when you buy, 3% costs when you sell so you're losing eight percent in the property value just in transaction fees um even if the price hasn't changed they haven't gone up or down just straight up transaction costs you probably haven't paid off on your mortgage that much in two to three years so if you sell even if it's at the same price you may have made it you may be down a little bit it's probably better to uh stay um you know think okay where am i going to be where's going to be good for the next five to ten years at least to really make it uh like uh, financially viable i think on this front too though now we're um <coughs> and and again i'm not like inaka like matt level inaka it was suburban fukuoka where we were living but still yes it was longer to walk to school it took them maybe 15 minutes instead of the five minutes that it takes now but they were walking along a beautiful road by a river. There were a lot of kids joining the group, working to, walking together. And um, that, that kind of made for better friendships too, which I think is a little bit more challenging in the city. Right now, he comes back from school. They're back in five minutes. And they don't even play outside as much as they used in the suburbs. They each you know, run into their house, to their PlayStations or what have you. I don't see them. If they go, they go to each other's place. And again, they're in front of the screen. Whereas when we were living in... in Again, not Inaka, but suburban city. Um, they were playing outside a hell of a lot more. Yeah, I think it could be a case by case. Like our, like our school is maybe five hundred meters down the road, so yeah. it's like a ten minute walk. My son. Um, I think even a short walk, like when you walk, you know. So for people who don't know the of the listeners, um, the schools will have a fixed route, a, a path where the all the kids need to walk along. And usually the, the kids walk by themselves, the parents don't walk them to school, even from first grade. Um, I forgot the name in Japanese. Uh, Tracy, do you know the name of those streets, the designated streets? <clears throat> uh, no, but you do have to, uh, they actually have, like in our school, they've got uh, color-coded routes and they have, they tie these ribbons on the side of their Vandersad and so that they know which route they're on. And, and like to and from walking to school, it's it's a, it's almost like a community activity as well. I know yeah. that, that the parents are the, out there with the flags and yeah, but some of the small business owners, you know, you know, at eight o'clock when the kids are walking to school, just happen to be outside watering their garden, you know, just keep, and you know, it's because all they're doing is just keeping the eye on their kids, even though they're not related to those actual kids, they're just keeping an eye like as community right. citizens. And I just, you know, even though I'd live, I, you know, I, I love living in Tokyo. I mean, I love the country, but I also do love living in Tokyo because it does, especially in little areas and little, these little pockets, it is like a little uh, village atmosphere here. Um, like I said, the small business owners, like the it was the uh, dry cleaning lady. She always went outside and was watering her garden just as the kids were going to school. She was just keeping a, a friendly eye because the kids would be running around and maybe not watching the traffic, but she would always just keep her eye out there. And, and also other small business owners would be um, walking along the designated path. And then there's the Wandies that, that do the, the, the level crossings. So, you know, um, even though the kids are not actually as parents, we're not allowed to walk kid, the kids to school for drop off. I'm um, keeping an eye on them, right? They're, they're well monitored. Not allowed to because the the crowding and you know so and also I think it's to build um, uh, resilience and you know uh, independence. Um, but the first the first time it happened that he walked to school by himself, I was that parent hiding behind like lamp. <laughs> you know, he was like, you know, he was six or something and it's like i'm so proud it's of funny, myself and i'm it's being funny how they build their uh, resilience and independence in some very specific areas in japan while everything else is like um j just 
guide them and avoid friction and do everything yeah. for them in advance, right? It's weird how they decide which things should be. Um, like, like, cause the, the walking to school thing is inconceivable for foreigners in yes. Western countries, right? Oh, Australia would never do it. Like you would well, like, <laughs> you, you deliver your kid to the front, like to the teacher, like you know, deliver them to the classroom. Yeah. Poor there's, sure. there's a, there's a first grade, a seven year old, like who was in the same kindergarten as my eldest. And um, his school was being uh, like rebuilt at the time. Like he's when he went to first grade, first grade. So he was actually catching a train and doing a transfer to and doing school. a transfer and, he, and doing a transfer being seven like it was like a, a stop transfer and stop so like two stops but they with a little transit um and the mum went with him like running for the first few weeks but then he's like seven year old on a train public transport doing transfers i'm yeah. like i don't want my kid to you know oh previously yeah to run around the corner and in australia no chance mm. hey, fyi i gotta go in like five Yep. Right. All righty. No, we're just we're talking. We're talking. I, I Sorry, Matt. We, we we didn't really talk about real estate, but um, this country versus city life. Um, that was a really good conversation, I think. Yeah, there's there's article. There was a big uh, was the Economist. There's there's been a steady flow of articles, which is refreshing too, because they're not directly about Akia, and because like I've stated previously, I, I kind of have a lot of problems with Akia articles. Um, but these articles tend to talk about, they're, they're not using the word migration, but talking about um, how there has been an uptick in people who are relocating from metro areas, not just Tokyo, but that's frequently kind of the, the focal point, um, and out into more exurban, suburban, or rural areas, yep. which are I support these 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 um, these articles because they're they're not making they're not painting a very specific picture of what they're doing. They're saying like, oh no, actually there is kind of a range yeah. of, of things. There, that there's something doing. going on. Muted migration, I would say. There's definitely something going on. Not as much as you'd expect in other countries, but there's definitely a movement there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I noticed on that point, like some some friends of mine, rather than migrating, like they will actually rent a month out in like the snow at a villa and the whole family would be there for a month um and so they're at the snow but and they're working so they're basically working from home in this villa so they're doing it without overly committing it's like one month of rental <laughs> yeah um and they're working from home so they're getting like the benefit but not really fully committing to to being out and moving their kids and the kids are like now they do a lot of online you know a lot, a lot of places doing uh support for online stuff like the elementary schools have it. So my son, because you know, because that family can't go out, um, uh, isn't leaving the house. He's been doing online um, for his elementary school. So that's now that that's sort of an option. Um, you know, it gives us more flexibility. So in our case, we we plan to go to Australia in August for uh, like for about a month. So and we've already spoken with the teacher that that's the plan, and they're going to do um, some online. Um, he's going to basically dial in remotely. And she'll give him some homework and he'll dial in remotely. Uh, so there's, there's like, now that that, inf that structure, because, you know, of the pandemic, that structure is in place, it gives people flexibility to do these kind of remote uh, semi, semi relocations to a degree. Um, I'm curious how that will, moving forward, how that's going to spread out. Like now people are doing one month at a time, the, the summer season or the, or the winter season, um, to make the most of the snow and to get out of the Tokyo heat. I'm curious how that's going to ramp up. Uh, Again, I think a, 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 big pro, a big problem for this trend here in Japan is that a lot of people just don't have the ability to do this kind of work remotely, right? If you think about your typical Japanese, you know, salaryman, the amount of them that can actually, you know, work remotely for an entire month without having to physically meet someone face to face is minute, to say the least. Yeah, and I mean, I, I my, my approach to that is it's sort of unfortunate, but you know, get the low line, low hanging fruit. Right, the salary men, they're not going to do it easily yeah. anyway. And uh, while I wouldn't want to call it a waste of time because that's kind of negative, it, it'll be a slog. Whereas <laughs> if you go after the people that currently, right now, are more able for whatever reason to do what Emil was talking about better than nothing, yeah, right. And if you hit them first and they start doing it, then you know, maybe the dominoes will start falling. But if I mean, really, this comes down to like target, targeted marketing. Um, well, so Trace, Trace, that's kind of what you're doing with your staycation. So you go like, you're going to jump in, Trace. 
Oh, no, it's just just agreeing with you, just saying that, um, you know, the going for the low-hanging fruit because the, the, the issue not necessarily is that people can't do it, it's that they're not the will there because it's not in the company cultures. So, you know, working with a company that's a bit more progressive, like, you know, companies like Rakuten, for example, um, you know, I don't think they'll ever go to, you know, everyone being in the office again. They're really giving giving flexibility. But that's a fairly progressive company. Mm. But, you know, you, you know, you look at a Sumitomo, for example, that is, you know, Zaibatsu, you know, the, that typical thing. That company, like a Dentsu, for example, that's never going to happen. But real estate in Japan well, is a bit Sorry, awful. I shouldn't say it's never going to happen, but it's, yeah. <laughs> the rest of the world, real estate is always um, on the edge of, cutting edge of technology, but here in Japan, it's very much an old school industry. Mm. But sorry, Matt, you got to go, right? That's, that's yeah, going to go. Yeah. Back out. So, good talking. See you next week. See you, See you next week. See, See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All righty. Well, that's probably a good place to stop, hey? Yep. That's not yeah. Good. All righty. Thank you very much. All right. See you next time. Okay, hope you've enjoyed that conversation, even though it wasn't strictly real estate related. I know I definitely did. And in case you're concerned, Emil's family is now absolutely fine. Again, thank you. It's been a couple of months since the video was recorded. And have no fear, I promise we'll be back talking nitty gritty real estate property again on our next episode. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company and you've got any sort of business or visa related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com. And he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku. Bye.